Welcome back. I hope you had a great lunch. I am Dennis Ailing. I am a uh, parishioner at St. Francis Xavier in Burbank. I am also what they refer to colloquially as a DIT, deacon in training. We'll see how far till they throw me out. But uh, I'm absolutely honored to be here with you. Um, you may have seen as you're going to and from through the uh, patio there, through the area, we've got these beautiful walls set up for, to build a mosaic. Um, we're inviting you this weekend, while you're here, to build a mosaic of love. Look, we have little cards out there. You can put how you were touched by love this weekend and then just post it. And when you do, you get this great little sticker. Let's look like that. Um, but really, just to, sh to, to show our theme, obviously, Be Loved, it's, it's, we want everyone to share how they're being loved this weekend at Congress. I am uh, absolutely delighted to be here to, to introduce to you uh, Cardinal Robert McElroy. Before I do, though, a couple of little housekeeping. First, if you've got one of those handy-dandy devices that has a battery in it, please find a way to silence it. I don't ask you to necessarily have to turn it off, but please do silence it so it's not disturbing everyone who's around. Um, there is, just a reminder, no recording of this, no audio or video recording on your own, please. And just to get us in the frame of mind we need to be coming back from lunch, why don't we just settle ourselves with just a little bit of prayer, if you would. Loving God, you are the fountain of life and maker of all things new. Give us a heart that is able to receive and perceive your unconditional love and bring out the best in other people. Teach us to love you and reflect your love and mercy. We ask this as we ask all things through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. I suspect most of you don't need to be introduced to Cardinal McElroy, but I do think it's worth us just remembering who we're honored to have in front of us. Cardinal McElroy is the uh, bishop of the uh, Diocese of San Diego, where he was appointed there in 2010. He was uh, elevated by Pope Francis to Cardinal just August of 22, so just a little over a year ago. He was also appointed by Pope Francis to participate in the Synod on Synodality, both this past October and this coming October. He has a, a long storied history of education and master's degree in American history, undergraduate education at Harvard, all those things that kind of set him up to really be in a position where he could listen and hear and open his eyes, his heart, and his spirit to what he was learning. We are truly honored and ecstatic to have Cardinal McElroy here. Please give him a very warm welcome. Thanks, Wayne. It is a great joy for me to be here with you today. This is one of the great synodal gatherings that takes place in our nation every year. It is a time when men and women and young people come together to pray together and call upon the Spirit of God to come into their hearts and souls, not merely as individuals, but as a community brought together from across the country to come close to our God, to know what it means to be truly be church together, to learn, to look at the light of the gospel, and see what it tells us about our pilgrimage here on this earth and to transform the world in which we live. So it's a great joy to be a speaker here at this Congress today and all that has gone before to build up the gospel of Jesus Christ lived out particularly in California and across the world. Three years ago, Pope Francis initiated a renewal which seeks to build a synodal culture for the church in every land and at every nation. This renewal is rooted in the proclamation that the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ 
constitute the most important reality of our life on this earth. It challenges every believer to conversion to the gospel and to a deep personal relationship with the Lord. The call to synodal renewal emphasizes the church as the pilgrim people of God and as a sacrament of God's saving presence in the world. The Pope stated that it is vital to construct a global synodal culture in the church. He pointed to eight elements of such a culture. First, a synodal church sees itself as the pilgrim people of God constantly on journey toward the kingdom. That notion of journey lies at the heart of synodality. We are together and we are all moving. Complacency cannot be part of the life of a synodal church. Two, synodality demands a profound stance, stance of authentic listening from every believer. In our world, we are so intent on speaking our point of view and not so open to simply sitting back and listening to others and listening particularly to that small voice of God's presence in our life to discern where the Lord is calling us. Synodality seeks a church rooted in word and sacrament. The Eucharist is at the center. A synodal church constantly looks outward to the transformation of the world in light of the gospel. A synodal church is humble and an honest church. No cover-ups. But synodal church is inclusive, embracing all. Todos, todos, todos. A synodal church is a participative church where active involvement in the church is nurtured and welcomed. And finally, a synodal church is a co-responsible church where all members are welcome to service and leadership in the light of their baptism, which calls them to service and leadership. As the synodal process began, Pope Francis called for a dialogue on these themes in every part of the world. Thus, in 2021, the Catholic community in the United States undertook the largest process of interpersonal dialogue and consultation ever held in our nation's history. Never in our country's history have this many people come together on a common project of consultation and listening, not a governmental project, not a societal project, not an ecclesial project. More than 500,000 men and women gathered together in prayer and discernment in their parishes, schools, cultural communities, and service organizations to share their joys and their sorrows, their hopes and their fears, touching upon the life of the church. One of the most striking realities reflected in our national dialogues was the commonality of the perceptions and questions of the people of God across dioceses, regions, and cultures within our country. While sometimes framed in different language or with different emphases, the joys, the hopes, the sorrows, and the fears of God's people were remarkably similar across the country. For this reason, it is truly possible to see in the results of the dialogue a composite picture of the Catholic community in the United States today and a picture of where we must move in the years to come. The synodal dialogues in our country gave deep witness to the beautiful forms of community that flourish at all levels in the life of the church. So many participants spoke beautifully of the profound relationships that they have formed in their parish, their school, their ministries to the poor and the suffering. The Diocese of Reno noted, quote, clearly people find their faith and experience of God through a community that welcomes, sustains, and challenges them." Unquote. People spoke lovingly of the webs of faith, friendship, searching, love, compassion, justice, and hope, which have enriched their lives in the community of the church. These include a vast array of prayer and formation groups, liturgical ministries, outreach to the sick and the marginalized, schools, and diverse cultural communities. 
The Catholic community is journeying together because in its vibrant and disparate communities, families rejoice together, mourn together, question together, grow together, and find a spiritual home, all within the framework of Catholic faith. The Synodal Dialogues testified overwhelmingly to the power of the Eucharist in the lives of believers. As the Diocese of San Diego noted in its synthesis, quote, the principal joy that emerged in the Synodal Sessions was participation in the sacramental life of the Church. The declaration of one participant that, quote, experiencing the beauty of Mass with our families is what brings us hope. This was emblematic of comments in virtually every small group sharing in our diocese. The vast majority of synod participants pointed to the sacramental life of the church as the richest source for sustenance and growth in their spiritual and moral lives. They expressed great gratitude to the priests <clears throat> for the sacrificial, prayerful, and careful, caring love that they bring to the sacramental life of the church. As celebrants of the Eucharist, and it brings sacraments to those in need. In pointing to the centrality of the Eucharist, the Synodal Witness made clear that there is a tremendous need for enhanced formation in all stages of life and regarding every ministry. Quote, participants of every age and demographic group spoke of the need for lifelong formation. They would like to see more opportunities for Bible study, in-person and online courses, lectures, small group discussions, and convocations. Members of the dioceses also wish the church to do more to support their spiritual growth by exposing them to the rich aspects of the heritage of Catholic spirituality. This notion of formation not only was central in the dialogues in the United States and around the world, but in the Roman Synod, it, it was absolutely one of the major areas of focus in all levels. The notion that as we are all part of the people of God, we are all called to deeper formation in our lives of faith. One of the recurring themes of the Synodal Dialogues throughout our country was anger at the way in which bishops knowingly reassigned priests whom they knew to have sexually abused minors in their past. The dialogues did point to the positive role the bishops play in the general life of the church, but the strength and starkness of the anger against our nation's bishops over reassignment is revealed in the comments of the national synthesis of all the dialogues. Quote, trust in the hierarchy is weak and needs to be strengthened. The sex abuse scandals and the way church leadership handled the situation are seen as one of the strongest causes of a lack of trust and credibility on the part of the faithful." Unquote. If trust in the leadership of the church has been enormously undermined by our history of covering up the sexual abuse of minors and vulnerable adults, wider issues of trust also surface repeatedly in the local dialogues. The people of God called repeatedly for a transformation of the secrecy <clears throat> in which so many elements of church life have been handled, especially regarding finances. The Diocese of Monterey stated, quote, in listening to God's people, it's apparent that there's still mistrust within the church. Many shared a desire for more transparency in leadership, decision-making, and financial matters. They called for more accountable leadership among the clergy and parish staff. <coughs> Regarding inclusion, <clears throat> the Synod synthesis from the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, reported that, quote, the call to the church to foster an inclusive community was one of the most predominant themes throughout the listening sessions. All must be welcomed to the Catholic faith with love as Jesus taught. That includes infants, the elderly, people of all races and cultures, the LGBT plus community, married, divorced, widowed, young adults, disabled, marginalized, and children. One Bridgeport parish commented, 
There is a sense that the future of the church may be hindered if leaders don't address the lack of acceptance of these groups, their gifts. The searing question of the church's treatment of LGBT plus persons was an immensely prominent facet of the synodal dialogues. Anguished voices within the LGBT communities in unison with their families cried out against the perception that they are condemned by the church and individual Catholics in a devastating way. Quote, faith-filled parents of LGBT plus children were especially vocal in their call for greater inclusion from the church, as were young adults, unquote. In addition, the dialogues pointed to the patterns of racism, prejudice, and discrimination that still deform the body of Christ. The Church of the Northwest spoke powerfully to this imperative. Quote, Catholic people of color spoke of routine encounters with racism, both inside and outside the church. Indigenous Catholics spoke of the generational trauma caused by racism and abuse in boarding schools. The issue of women constituted a central focus of critique in the national dialogues. The Diocese of Las Vegas concluded that, quote, as regards the role of women, a small minority of respondents voiced the opinion that women should be excluded <clears throat> from any liturgical roles. But the vast majority of respondents strongly opposed this attitude and urged church leaders to recognize, quote, the unique charisms, quote, and pastoral gifts women bring to the church. Broad support for ordaining women was voiced by those participating in the synodal process as were calls to include women in leadership positions discussions and decisions on all levels in the church. Many dialogue participants linked the exclusion of women to the wider exclusion of lay Catholics as a whole from real core responsibility in the church. The people of Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska spoke directly to this reality. Quote, many want to see church leadership take more seriously the talents and knowledge of the laity. Some expressed the need to use more effective parish councils and diocesan pastoral councils to explore more deeply with the laity how best to participate in understanding the mission of the church and its efforts to evangelize its members in the world. The question of co-responsibility in the church was linked in many dialogues to the issue of clericalism in Catholic life. The synodal witness continually expressed Great gratitude to priests for their devoted service to the church and the sacrifices they make. Yet the corrosive elements of clerical culture serviced in comments about priests or bishops who do not see in their own limitations the invitation to develop more collaborative relationships with laity, not fewer. The church in the Pacific Coast requested greater, quote, formation for seminarians and those already ordained to better understand human and pastoral needs, cultural sensitivity and awareness, greater emphasis on social justice, sharing resources with the needy, balancing the adherence to dogmatic teachings of the faith with care for the emotional needs of parishioners, how to include laity in decision-making and learning to speak the truth with empathy, creativity, and honesty." Unquote. The National Synthesis said, practically all synodal consultations shared a deep wake, a deep ache in the wake of the departure of young people and viewed this as integrally connected to becoming a more welcoming church. The church in New Jersey and Pennsylvania said, quote, youth who participated in synodal sessions stressed that they should not be seen and spoken of mostly as the future of the church, but should be recognized for their importance now and given a significant voice in the present. They want to be both seen and heard and included more in church life, especially participating meaningfully in parish and diocesan councils and ministries. Young adults often spoke of feeling as foreigners in the church in which they grew up. There were many calls for the church to speak out about issues of particular interest to young people, such as justice, race, and climate change. 
Thus, the first stage of Pope Francis' process for synodal renewal revealed a series of common and concrete conclusions in the U.S. It pointed to an ecclesial community which experiences the church as spiritually nourishing in the most profound way, a community in which wonderful relationships of friendship, service, conversation, and moral and spiritual growth take place daily. But the dialogues also called for enormous changes on issues of formation, inclusion, accompaniment, co-responsibility, and the effective proclamation of both the gospel of Jesus Christ and the doctrinal tradition of the church. To an amazing degree, and this was really very stunning, these same themes characterized dialogues in most of the other regions of the global church. Weaving together of these many national dialogues, the synod leadership team in Rome composed a set of questions and observations that needed to be addressed by the synodal process as it moved forward. As a consequence, when the second stage of the synodal process began in Rome this past October, Pope Francis and the synod delegates began with a genuinely universal and comprehensive framework for undertaking the renewal of the synodal church. The Roman Assembly. The very nature of the synodal assembly in Rome testified to the church as the entire people of God. Bishops, laywomen and men, religious priests and deacons, all sitting around common tables together in union with the Pope, dialoguing in deep faith, voting equally upon the interim report that would be the basis for future action. These dimensions of the assembly experience point to the reality that all of us in that hall were journeying together on the pilgrimage on earth in the name of Jesus Christ. It was a stark contrast with past synods where bishops alone voted and the bulk of the sessions were spent listening to a seemingly endless series of speeches that left participants passive and disengaged. The method of dialogue in Rome was conversation in the spirit, a process of deep discernment which truly opened up the hearts of the synod participants. Beginning with the word of God and prayer, the participants at each table would share their initial reflections on the topic to be discussed that each listening to the other with substantial pauses between contributions for prayer and reflection. Then building on a series of such rounds, the table moved more directly to listening to addressing the issue for that session. The second round was after you've listened, you then have to speak about what you heard from others that were of import. You couldn't say about anything you had said. So it was listening to everybody and then going to the next step and a series of steps beyond that. This method diminished frictions and magnified commonalities precisely because all came to see with a greater understanding the faith of the other. That became the central focus. We were all disciples together. The Synod was a profound experience of the universality of the Church. Because we switched tables five times during the course of the Synod, each of us came into contact with the face of the people of God in every land and continent and across a multitude of cultures. It was fascinating, transformative, and powerfully transcendent to witness God's diverse tapestry of grace at work throughout the world. One of the interesting things is we, we, we comprehended things in different ways and understood each other's cultures and ecclesial experiences much more deeply through these encounters. Things that I've been around different parts of the church for a long time, but there was a great newness to understanding how the lived reality of being church really takes place in lands far different than our own. There were enormous areas of in which there was a broad consensus. The centrality of the kerygma, the missionary identity of the church, the importance of placing the Eucharist at the center of every element of ecclesial life, 
the need to expand and invigorate ministries open to the laity, the church's imperative to go out of itself to embrace and advocate for the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, and the hopeless, the importance of a paradigm shift in the church's invitation to and treatment of women, the need for a global rather than a national or monocultural perspective. But there were also areas of deep divide on how meaningfully to include the laity in the church while maintaining the integrity of its hierarchical nature, of how deeply enculturation and decentralization should proceed in the Catholic community, on questions of the diaconate and inclusion for LGBT plus communities. In the wake of the first Roman Synod, seven overarching questions, in my opinion, remain the most important for the next stages of the synodal process. Number one, the nature of discernment. Synodality points to the reality that the whole of the people of God are journeying together in the life of the church and synodal action. This means that we cannot operate from a mindset of complacency or one that accentuates the differences among the baptized. Rather, we must view ourselves as the people of Israel were called to do in the desert, unified in their faith, and in their understanding that God was calling them to an ever new way of life. As we were reminded at the Roman Assembly, our individualistic perspectives on issues needed to be replaced by a communal understanding rooted in our common identity as disciples of Jesus Christ, each and every one of us. Listening was the prerequisite for authentic synodal process. It was difficult at times, and it was demanding at times, but it was essential for us to move forward and make progress in a single way of coming to understand where God was calling us to move. The synthesis of the synodal assembly characterized synodality in these words. In its broadest sense, synodality can be understood as Christians walking in communion with Christ toward the kingdom, along with the whole of humanity. Its orientation is toward mission, and its practice involves gathering and assembly at each level of ecclesial life. It involves reciprocal listening, dialogue, community discernment, and creation of a consensus as an expression that renders Christ present in the Holy Spirit, each taking decisions in accordance with their responsibility. But how can we bring this experience and culture effectively to our local parish and diocesan life. The process of discernment used in Rome is far too time consuming to use with regularity in parish and diocesan life and decision making. It won't work here. How can we develop and implement analogical methods of discernment which authentically emphasize listening to the spirit and to others, and to do so in a form that will be practical for general use in our diocese, in our parish, in our groups of faith. Number two, the issue of change and continuity in the life of the church. It is essential to safeguard the deposit of faith, but how do the doctrinal tradition and history of the church restrict the church's ability to refine its teaching when confronted with a world where life itself is evolving in critical ways and is becoming clear that on some issues, the understanding of human nature and moral reality upon which previous declarations of doctrine were made were in fact limited or defective. After the conclusion of the October assembly, Pope Francis pointed to a pathway for answering this question with his motu proprio ad theologiam promovenda. In it, he calls for a transformation of Catholic theology so that it moves away from abstraction and ideology and towards, quote, mercifully addressing the open wounds of humanity and creation and within the folds of human history to which it prophesies the hope of an ultimate fulfillment. Let me say that again. He's saying this is what theology should be seeking to mercifully address <clears throat> the open wounds of humanity and creation and within the folds of human history to which it prophesies the hope 
of an ultimate fulfillment. Such a theology is inherently pastoral. With theological reflections starting from, quote, the different contexts and concrete situations in which people find themselves. Placing itself at the service of evangelization, it seeks engagement and dialogue in every sphere of knowledge in order to reach and involve the whole people of God in theological research, so that the life of the people may become theological life. In other words, our theology, informed by the revelation and tradition, our theology begins with God's enfleshment in the daily life of our people. Such a pathway for theology must be continually nourished by the doctrinal tradition of the church. In fact, the theological pathway outlined by Pope Francis can itself foster greater authentic fidelity to the positive faith and revelation, not less, since it is embedded firmly in the real world where our earthly pilgrimage takes place. This is pointing toward a theology of the, uh, the Catholic faith, which is truly pastoral at its core. Three, the question of clericalism. The nature, presence, and implications of clericalism surfaced throughout the assembly in Rome. The synod synthesis states, quote, clericalism stems from a misunderstanding of the divine call, viewing it more as a privilege than a service and manifesting itself in the exercise of power in a worldly manner that refuses to allow itself to be accountable. This distortion of the policy vocation needs to be challenged from the earliest stages of formation by ensuring close contact with the people of God. One of the most significant contributions that lay members made to the Synodal Assembly was to press deeply and continually for transparency rather than secrecy in the life of the church. On issues ranging from finances to processes for assessing allegations against leaders in the church to questions of Episcopal appointments and the evaluation of clergy, the lay participants, participants in the Synodal Assembly made clear that rejecting clericalism demands a major transformation of the manner in which the church approaches secrecy and accountability. There will always be a need for confidentiality in many sectors in the life of the church. But we have to look at that carefully and understand where accountability and the problems of secrecy outweigh uh, our tendency in the life of the church to keep things secret. Four, decentralization in the life of the church. One of the central topics of discussion at the Roman Assembly flowed from the diversity of cultures in the global Catholic community. The interplay between unity and diversity is especially pronounced in the effort to understand the proper relationship between particular cultures and their histories and the need for adaptation on local levels. The synodal synthesis states, quote, the cultural, historical, and continental contexts in which the church is present, reveal different spiritual and material needs. This shapes the culture of the local churches, their missionary priorities, the concerns and gifts that each of them brings to the synodal dialogue, and the languages with which they express themselves. During the days of the assembly, we were able to experience directly and most joyfully the diverse expressions of being church. So there's a great move toward decentralization, particularly within differing cultures. In my own view, this issue of culture and decentralization is reflected in the current diverging pastoral paths across continents to the application of the document Fiducia Supplicans. It is crucial to emphasize that Fiducia simply clarified questions about the permissibility of a priest pastorally blessing those in irregular or gay unions in a non-liturgical setting and manner. No change in doctrine was made. We have witnessed the reality that bishops in various parts of the world have made radically divergent decisions about the acceptability of such blessings in their countries based substantially on cultural and pastoral factors, as well as neocolonialism. 
This is decentralization in the life of the global church. But this decentralization must not obscure in any manner the rigorous obligation of every local church in justice and solidarity to protect LGBT persons in their lives and equal dignity. And it cannot obscure the obligation of the church in every land to offer genuine accompaniment to those who are divorced and remarried without an annulment uh, and to LGBT men and women in their lives of faith and pilgrimage. It is wholly legitimate for a priest to personally decline to perform the blessings out, outlined in fiducia because he believes that to do so would undermine the strength of marriage. But it is particularly distressing in our own country that the opposition to fiducia focuses overwhelming on, overwhelmingly on blessing those in same-sex relationships rather than those many more men and women or in heterosexual relationships that are not ecclesially valid. If the reason for opposing such blessings is really that this practice will blur and undermine the commitment to marriage, then the opposition should, one thinks, be focusing at least equally on blessings for these heterosexual relationships in our country. We all know why it is not. An enduring animus among far too many toward LGBT persons. Number five, what does it mean to be a participative and co-responsible church? The Synodal Synthesis frames this question in these words, quote, before any discussions of charisms and ministries, we were all baptized into the one spirit and the one body. Therefore, among all the baptized, there's a genuine equality of dignity and a common responsibility for mission, according to the vocation of each. Much of the time of the Synodal Assembly, was spent in understanding the implications of these words. A critically important fruit of this discussion was to refine the teaching of the Second Vatican Council about the role of the laity in the life of the church. This was a very important moment in the Roman Synod. The synthesis states, Vatican II and subsequent magisterial teaching present the distinctive mission of the laity in terms of sanctification of temporal or secular realities. However, the reality is that in pastoral practice at the parish diocese and recently even the universal levels, it increasingly entrusts lay people with tasks and ministries within the life of the church itself. Vatican II had proclaimed that the laity had a privileged place in the transformation of the world. The Synodal Assembly was stating that lay women and men also have a privileged place in the transformation of the church. The synthesis points to Predicate Evangelium, Pope Francis' apostolic constitution on the reform of the Roman Curia, as a pivotal pathway for understanding this new reality. Many of the participants at the Synod shared their frustration about the inability of local churches to invite lay leaders into important positions in the life of dioceses and parishes because of impediments in canon law. The Pope's declaration affirms a notion of authority and power that distinguishes the, between those positions that truly require holy orders and those that can be empowered in the Roman Curia by the Pope. They are not coextensive. This teaching could be a foundation for opening up new pathways to lay leadership in critically important areas of church life at diocesan and local levels. I experienced this in my own diocese in San Diego. Uh, we have, for example, uh, in, our, in our marriage tribunal, a priest who has a degree in canon law, if he's hearing a case, he is the only one judge that can give the case. If it's a lay person who is the primary judge of the case, they have to have three judges. It just doesn't make sense. Or we have another one. In, in my diocese, we have uh, Rod Valdivia, who's worked for us for so many years, and he, he is really COO in a sense. Uh, we don't give him that title. He does all demonstrations. So he should be the moderator of the Curia. Uh, and, and I would like to do that, but I can't do that because only a priest could be moderator of the Curia under current law. So what I've done is 
I made him vice moderator of the Curia, and we don't have a moderator of the Curia. <laughs> and that will be, continue to be true as long as he's there. But, I mean, these are these anomalies where, where truly bringing uh, lay people into leadership, uh, uh, this, this was a major theme, and I think there's going to be a lot of progress on questions uh, like this. If the desire to open ecclesial life more fully to lay leadership and participation resonated widely in the assembly, the desire to bring women more fully into leadership and decision-making roles provided the most inspiring moments of the meeting in Rome. Repeatedly during the spiritual and theological reflections which took place during the assembly, the point had been made that Jesus in his invitation to women as disciples and witnesses to the resurrection, produced a paradigm shift for the treatment of women in the culture of his time. Most in the Synodal Assembly felt that the time has come for just such a shift in the life of the church. The Assembly, yeah, this, this was a very move, moving moment in, in the Assembly. We spent about two days uh, focused on these questions, and it was a very powerful moment. The assembly synthesis states, quote, churches all over the world have expressed a clear request that the active contribution of women should be recognized and valued, and their pastoral leadership increase in all areas of the church's life and mission. It is urgent to ensure that women can participate in decision-making processes and assume roles of responsibility in pastoral care and ministry. There were more than 80 proposals for action contained in the results of the Synodal Assembly in Rome. There was only one that was labeled urgent, and that was the, the, the position on women. This, this was a big part of what we were doing over it was a groundswell, and it, and it was very much across the globe. Sixth, the meaning of inclusion in the life of the church. The synthesis approved by the Roman Assembly forthrightly proclaims the need to make men and women effectively protagonists in their life and society in the church, despite barriers of poverty, education, race, or gender. It condemns all of these barriers as sinful. It recognizes and condemns powerfully the structures in society and the church that grind people down with unceasing exclusion. It calls for deepening the church's preferential option for the poor and the elimination of all forms of violence and exploitation in the Catholic community. Moreover, it condemns all of these evils with the humble recognition that they have existed within the life of the church and are a repudiation of Jesus Christ. But regarding the exclusion of the divorced and the remarried and LGBT Catholics, the synthesis was far more muted. I believe that the nature of inclusion in the church is most authentically reflected in the assembly synthesis discussion of the pastoral embrace of the Lord himself. Quote, several gospel passages reveal that Jesus meets people in the uniqueness of their personal story and situation. He never begins from the perspective of prejudice or labels, but from the authenticity of relationship to which he commits himself wholeheartedly, even at the cost of experiencing rejection. Jesus always listens to the cry for help of those in need, even in situations in which it remains unexpressed. He engages in gestures that communicate love and restore confidence. He makes new life possible with his presence. Those who meet him come away transformed. This happens because the truth of which Jesus is the bearer is not an idea, but the very presence of God in our midst. And the love with which he acts is not just a feeling, but the justice of the kingdom that changes history." Unquote. Let us pray that in the coming year, this beautiful vision of Jesus' pastoral ministry 
may light the way for the church's discernment and ministry to all those who are marginalized in the church we love so deeply. We stand now in the middle of the synodal journey that Pope Francis has summoned us to in the renewal of the church. The voices of the people of God across every continent shared their joys, sorrows, and hopes in the church, thereby creating a foundation for global synodal discernment. The first synodal assembly met in Rome and discerned in God's grace the outlines of what a synodal renewal could look like. Now consultations are taking place across the world to reflect on the work of the synodal assembly and to provide input for the next assembly meeting this October. In union with the Holy Father, the next assembly will complete the work they have begun, and then the Pope will finalize and proclaim the steps we will be taking as a church to renew our ecclesial culture and transform the world. We stand at the middle of the synodal journey, a journey which promises to produce immense blessings for the church that we love. As pilgrims in this earthly city, let us rejoice at where we have come from and where we are going on the synodal pathway. Thank you. So, Colonel McElroy has graciously allowed to take questions we have a microphone right here in the center. If anyone would like to come up and ask a question of the Cardinal, um, he's open to answering questions. And we have about 20 or so minutes. If anyone would like to please come up. Only, come easy, up. only easy questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Cardinal McElroy. What an elegant talk today. Thank you very much. Do you think synodality will survive after Pope Francis is gone? Uh, I hope so. I think so. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think it, because synodality cannot simply exist at an at a ethereal level as a universal thing. It's got to have roots. And so part of the process is let it take, take root. If it begins to take root, then I think the answer is more, much more probably yes. The other thing is synodality is a difficult concept for us to understand, you know. It really is a type of culture with those points I tried to outline, or some of them, of what it should be. Um, uh, discernment lies at the heart of it. And, 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 and thus, if we, if we lead our decision-making, into processes of discernment. And it doesn't have to be like every parish council meeting is done that way, but some should be. Some should be done in that sort of prayerful process where people speak from their hearts, everybody speaks, because that's another problem in all these groups we have. Uh, everybody speaks and then everybody listens and then speaks to what they have heard. Uh, I think that's a, a very important window to wonderful progress for the church. I do think on the, the other areas too, some of these areas of li like inclusion, the role of women and so forth, I think these reforms as they move forward, yes, I think those will take root and I don't think they're gonna be reversed. So. Cardinal McElroy, I know that um, the prospect of renewing the diaconate as a whole, there's the question of possibly including women, but there's also this broader conversation about renewing the diaconate. And I wonder if you can speak to the role of that renewal, renewal in terms of creating a synodal culture. Does it have a part? Sure. Uh, that was one of the most fascinating things. The most important elements, you know, I think were on the role of women uh, and the general question of discernment. But one of the most fascinating things was we got onto the question of, of uh, uh, women in the diaconate. Because it started out as a binary question. Are you for or against having women as deacons? And there were many in each camp. But when we got into the discussions at the discernment process, I was stunned. I was in a group with 10, 10, 10 people. Uh, let's see, seven of us were bishops in that group. Uh, th uh, we had a woman religious, a lay person, uh, two lay people. Uh, so, uh, and I was stunned because three of the 
bishops at my table were from Africa. And they said, well, we don't have deacons. Basically, Africa doesn't have any deacons. And the reason is something very interesting. Uh, they have something which for them is spectacularly good. They have what are called animators. Have you ever heard of this term, animators? In, in, in Africa and, and in a certain extent in Latin America is a reality. It's a position in the parish which is kind of a combination of catechist, kind of pastoral leader, and spiritual cheerleader. Uh, it's a very powerful role. It is what the word says, animator. To animate the spirit of the community and animate the faith of the community. That involves catechesis, of course. So because they had animators, and had them, I've had them all along, many of whom are women. I would guess the majority of animators are women. They didn't see the need to have the diaconate. So, and there were certain other countries in, in, outside of Africa that don't have the diaconate either. So it became a different question because for a large block of the churches there, it's not an issue because they don't have deacons. But then when we got into the discussion, it, 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 it branched out into what should the diaconate be, permanent, permanent diaconate be. And uh, so uh, there was a lot of feeling that there should be more emphasis on, on uh, the poor of the margin, service of the poor and the margin, that that should be the central focus. Uh, and then, then came the, this notion that, well, we, we should imagine, reimagine uh, the diaconate, okay? Uh, so that got a lot of momentum because once we got into the question, but you can see how it became a, from binary question, it became a much larger thing. What should the di permanent diaconate be? Uh, and then the question came up about should there be, should we have transitional deacons? Uh, because it, transitional deacons are a little odd. They've, they've, you know, you're only a deacon for maybe six months or a year. We don't usually bring people into ministry, in particular ordained ministry, with the notion that they're gonna hold that office for just a short period. So uh, the notion was that if we, if we got rid of um, permanent deacons, I'm sorry, transitional deacons, then there would not be as much a problem on the linkage to ordination to priesthood making it easier to have women deacons. So all of these things are talked about. How it's gonna go, I don't know. I just wanna say, it's an interesting example of what happened in the process where a question where you thought you either need to go this way or that way became a much more full-bodied question. And frankly, enlightening to me, I didn't know the church in Africa basically doesn't have deacons. Some, some do, but basically doesn't have deacons. So is that helpful? Okay, sure. Please. Yes, that was very helpful. I took notes. <laughs> um, I am a graduate of Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, and I'm a parishioner at Mission San Diego. Um, so I'll be making an appointment with you, Cardinal. <laughs> um, my question for the assembly today, though, you very... I mean, I couldn't write fast enough. You were talking about the importance of a paradigm shift that you had talked about um, at the Roman Assembly, and you added, like, like it was mind-blowing to me, that the Pope um, said something about doctrine restricting the living church and that he wanted theology to be the focus of that. And as we know, Theology either leads and then the change comes, or it's the other way around. So where are we in that dialogue? Yeah, yes, he's in this document from Avendam, he's talking about a new, well, not it's not new, but I mean, it's, it's a recovered notion of what theology should be, that it should be rooted in the life of real, real world and the real lives of people. Because theology is meant to reveal to us God's grace for us, God's plan for us, God's obligations that come from God to us, all of these things, but they, must, they can't be too abstract. That's, uh, I think the most important thing the Pope has done, this Pope has done, is pastoral theology. He shifted the notion to try to get away from abstraction, to make it toward, in the real lives of people, 
And, and he uses that, that image, uh, you know, of the, what is it called? Um, the hospital. Field hospital, the field hospital. Okay, now I'm gonna date myself with this. But when, I, when he uses the image of the field hospital, I don't think of what we see now on TV where these very antiseptic things. I, I'm old enough, I hate to say this, I'm old enough to have seen Gone with the Wind, okay? Do you remember the scene, the scene with the field hospital? What it is is it's a shot in the Civil War and wounded are on both sides. And it, it shows a shot of about five people and then it begins to pan back and you realize there are thousands and thousands of people screaming out for help in need and they're all just hurting and bleeding. And so that's what I think of when I think of the field hospital. It's that, it's that every one of us is in the field hospital. Yes, sir. I like the reference to the field hospital, and I've listened to uh, reports from across the country uh, on the Synod, various organizations, and I work for an organization called Catholic Big Brothers Big Sisters. I can't hear him. Can you hear him? Here, in, it's in Los Angeles. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Am I am I not speaking loud enough? Could, could you could you get right. closer? A little closer. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, anyways, I did see in the documents that have been produced a reference to non ecclesial uh, involvement. I'm just wondering. My organization isn't part of the church, but we are doing the work of the church in the field hospital. How much of the input? the listening is going to include organizations that are non-ecclesial, like mine. There are lots of us out there. And, you know, we're converting people just, right. you know, as, as the church is, so. I think it's, it's key to go back to those two things we talked about. What is the vocation of the laity? And the Vatican Council said quite strongly, it is the transformation of the world. And there are Catholic organizations that try to transform the world, and there are Catholics in non-Catholic organizations that transform the world. And so it's in both of those capacities. So there's no distinction. You know, if you're doing God's work, uh, you know, the fact whether you're in a Catholic organization or not is not the crucial point. You're doing God's work here. And so it, it, mission is really important. What, what the, this uh, Synodal Assembly refocus things is that it's not only external in the world, but it's internal in the life of the church too for the lady. But certainly that transformation of the world is pre predominantly falls to lay people because they have most access to all of the sectors in our society and business and in, in, in the culture that can transform the world. So you're transforming the world in God's grace, you know. So yes, it's a very Catholic thing. Thank you so much, uh, Cardinal McElroy. I hope this is okay to bring up here, but how do you respond to, particularly here in the United States, the number of bishops and cardinals who are opposed, not just to synodality, but to Pope Francis himself, because I think that's pretty scandalous as well. It's Uh, I'm going to leave that to the next speaker. No, I'll answer. <laughs> you did say easy question. Uh, yeah, that's just an easy question. I would say this. It's a pro problem, I think, to categorize the bishops too rigidly. Um, the most important thing for a bishop to be is pastoral, in my view. Uh, and ideological considerations are there and all. But the most important thing is pastoral. Um, and so I would say that's the most important. And, and frankly, if you put Pope Francis in this room, I think he'd say that too. So that's, that's the ultimate criterion for a bishop. Is he pastoral? The question of whether he's strongly Pope Francis, medium Pope Francis, okay, but not great with Pope Francis, leaning against or against, 
is secondary. It is a problem, though. It is a problem um, to have the, uh, what, what's called a bishop is supposed to call, have affective uh, collegiality with the pope. That means affective in your heart. And so th that's what's to lead us all to, to be one with, with uh, the Holy Father on things. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't disagree with things. People always have in every pontificate. But it's important that you genuinely, your stance is one of affective union with the Holy Father. So I would say those two things. That won't get me into too much trouble. <laughs> First of, all, first of all, thank you, Your Eminence, for your wisdom and, uh, and insights. Always been a big uh, follower and lover of it, a big fan, honestly. Um, so one of the big ticket items that come out of the Synod is the thoughts of the married priesthood, you know? So I guess your thoughts, comments, concerns, questions, um, just, I guess, overall, you know, what is, what is on the table for that, uh, that idea, the the married priesthood. I didn't quite hear. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, married priesthood. Well, of course, we do have married priests in the Catholic Church in the sense that uh, Maronite priests are often married. Uh, Ukrainian priests uh, are, are, are married. Um, and so uh, it exists within, the, there's no doctrinal problem with it it raises a huge series of questions. It, it really isn't so much a doctrinal question. It's a question of what is best for a ministerial life, for a pre, life of priesthood. There are pros and cons to it. You know, family life brings a lot, and being married is a lot of stability, a lot of enrichment, a lot of joy. It's also a lot of hardship and you know, struggle. Uh, and, and so, and there are situations the priests have in being, uh, in being celibate that is not an easy thing to live out. Uh, I would just say one thing on priesthood. It, it's still true that overwhelmingly, something like 80% of priests find their life very meaningful or glad they became priests. That's much higher than most other people in other uh, vocations or lines of work. Uh, so, but... But I, I don't have a position one way or the other on it. It comes down to a practical question. Which is better for service to the people of God? I, I, I don't know. Because I, I, I see both sides, so I don't lean either way on that myself. But it's certainly not a problem doctrinally or anything to do with it. Okay. Thank you, Cardinal McIntyre. And thank you for your inspirational speech, which enlightened of us, everybody here. I got only a simple questions in my mind. After all of those ideologies that you have uh, spoken, and this uh, enriched uh, culturization, how come we have shortage of priests and closure of Catholic Church? That's my question. I, I, thank you. Oh, could you... Could, the problem is the speakers go this way. So oh, I'm so sorry. It, no, it's not your fault, really. Uh, My questions would be, in spite of those inspirational talk about ideologies, about occultizations and measures to improve the church and transformations in the Catholic Church, how come we have shortage of priests and also closure of Catholic churches? Thank you. Some Catholic churches are closed. Well, you know, a, a big part of it, the shortage of priests, you know, has been coming for some time, and it's acute in different parts of the country. Um, but uh, the closing of churches uh, has not been so much a California phenomenon. It is devastating on the East Coast and the Midwest. Um, and partly it's demographic changes. Um, people are living in different places. For example, I remember we, we did close some churches in San Francisco when I was there, and I got stuck doing it. Um, uh, we had, but they were for seismic reasons. But we had five churches within four blocks of each other. 
because we had the Italian National Parish and we had the his, this parish for Spain and then the Mexican National Parish. They were all within a few blocks. So it was ridiculous because they, they weren't filling any of them. Uh, and then we had the seismic challenge. So, uh, but, but, but overall, I just had to say, it's because in large parts of the country, the number of Catholics participating in the life of church is declining. And particularly with young people, I, I myself think our greatest pastoral challenge in this country is young people. Because it's an avalanche that young people are leaving us. I don't have a lot of answers of how to do that. But I think, frankly, that's our most important pastoral priority. Uh, and, and I know it is for so many parents, too. We have to try to raise their kids in faith, and then the kids who are good people, but just aren't active in the life of the church. So. I think we have time for two more questions. My question is um, probably very simple, but it's, it's one in regards to the transformation and the new paradigm. I mean, paradigms are starting all over, changing greatly. Uh, this, is, this is just a question, because I know our church says the Roman Catholic Church possesses all divine truth, and understanding continues to grow. So when you talk about a paradigm, then that's, is that what you're talking about, that we, we have all that we have, and yet it, how it is and what it means continues to grow? The, the paradigm shift that was talked about at the assembly was very specific. It was the notion that when Jesus walked on the earth, his relationship with women calling them to discipleship was radically out of sync with his culture. <clears throat> and so it was a paradigm shift for the treatment of women in his time. And so the, the belief was, and the, most in the assembly felt this way, there needs to be a paradigm shift in the treatment of women and calling them to participation and activity in the life of the church. Okay, thank you. That's how it was used, yeah. Thank you very much, Cardinal, for today. This was absolutely inspiring. My question is this, with respect to the element of clericalism, would it not seem helpful for the seminary formation process to be completely revisited. I think of the lady who posed a question uh, who was educated at CTU in Chicago. And the, what I know of that institution is that people who are in the process of being formed as, sem as future priests sit side by side with men and women who are lay men and women who are equally well getting a theological formation. And there's something of a leveling process in there where you don't get to walk away thinking that you are the only theological expert sure, when you're sure. surrounded by others whose homework has been done perhaps with a little more diligence than you if you happen to be one of those unfortunates. And so I'm just saying perhaps we could rethink that whole way of, of imagining seminary formation without its isolationism and the potential for a rather closed culture. I'd appreciate your thoughts on that, and thank it, you again. It was, the formation of priests was a huge topic at the city. In fact, it was the only topic on which the Pope interrupted the flow to make a very vigorous comment, okay, uh, in favor of addressing the whole question. And, and I had to say, it was global. Now, and I want to put it in the context. There's probably no question bishops kind of worry about more than the formation of their priests. You don't know what seminary to send. It's just very hard to know what program should be all these things. Uh, but across the globe, there was dissatisfaction in the formation, uh, which it surprised me that it was global. So uh, I, I think that's could be attended to, but yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, please give, just join me in giving uh, Cardinal McElroy a tremendous thank you. We have been honored. Okay, thank you. Please do take your time to contribute to our mosaic outside. <laughs> Your stories of being loved here at Congress, and make sure that you, uh, you know, we have these evaluation forms. Make sure you put down something that says you'd love Colonel McElroy back here as often as possible.
Thank you all very much. Have a great time the rest of the session.